Sundays I've kept the message sort of Christmassy, Christmassy as I can. Um, I'm probably not the, a traditional preacher in that sense. Um, I like to see what else is in God's Word when I read it. You know, when I read about the, the babe and the manger and everything else. And that's all very important. You know, Christ came as the weakest possible person he could. And that's as a little baby. And that is done for a purpose. He came as the weakest. And we see this in the day that, you know, with all the horrible things that happened with abortion and everything, mm. the weakest people in our society are treated cruelly. Yeah. Like, I don't understand it. I do, but I don't. Uh, but this, the last three weeks, uh, we first looked at uh, Matthew uh, chapter 1. Um, the title then was to prove or not to prove. And uh, it was the time for, uh, for proving. Um, let me just get my mind back to it again, Matthew chapter 1. Just stay with me and look there, please. Um, that's right, when we had divine uh, protection for Christ... He had divine protection, and we saw this in the um, each time the uh, the people were warned of God. Like Joseph, uh, you had the wise men; they're all warned of, of God to uh, keep out of danger. And indeed, we found that. And there's a reason for it. It was to also prove our hearts. It's in Deuteronomy uh, eight eight two. We'll turn there shortly. Then last week it was unbelief at Christmas. We saw that in Luke chapter one, which is where we're sort of following on from from last week. And there is a comparison between Zacharias and Mary. Zacharias, they were both believers, they were both saved people, but Zacharias, he had that tinge of unbelief in his heart. And when the angel Gabriel told him, well, you're going to have a son, you're going to name him John, he sort of said, really? He didn't believe. But yet Mary believed. We saw that in verse um, 38 of chapter 1 in Luke. And it says, And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. I'm yours, Father, I'm yours. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. In other words, Mary submitted straight away. She submitted straight away. Zacharias didn't. Even though he'd been praying for all those years, when that prayer was finally heard, he didn't believe it. And I think sometimes that can, we can even react like that at times. You know, we're praying for something, and when God gives us the answer, you go, oh, have I really got to do this now? Have I really got to stand up in front of people and preach and teach? Have I, have I really got to be teaching children in a, in a classroom? And some people find that difficult. Mm. But see, they're gifts from God when you do these things. You might not be good at them, but after a while, it teaches you how to do it. Yeah. Even teaching children, which I'd like to start up again. COVID seemed to have crushed that, but I think in the new year, we will start again with Sunday school. It's important. Children need to be taught. Yeah. That's why I love it every morning when we have the sword search. Children are opening their Bibles. How many churches do we see today do that? Really opening their Bibles. You just have it on the screen. We need to open our Bibles. That teaches a habit, a good habit. And that's to open our Bibles daily and read what God has got for us. That's how he speaks to us, through his words. That which is perfect is come and we have it here in our Bibles. So we looked at that last week. And we're finishing off with Mary, but today's title is There's Something About Mary. There is something about Mary that we need to look at this morning. There are three points we need to go through, and I'll keep my eye on the time. But the first point is this Mary, this particular Mary here, possessed God. She just didn't profess God, she possessed God. And you see that in the, um, in the, um, uh, what do we call it, the, um, the, tw- the, the, uh, the five foolish virgins mm-hmm. and, the, and the five wise yeah. virgins. Yeah. Five possessed the oil, mm-hmm. five did not mm-hmm. possess the oil. That's right. And I sometimes align that in that parable with they possessed Christ and the other five did not possess we're not let through. There are other, in context, there are other implications with that uh, parable. But initially, that's the way I see it. Five possessed oil, the Holy Spirit in their lives, salvation. The other five did not. They may have made a profession. They may have made a profession. But let's read here Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 56. And we'll get a handle on this, please. 
So follow me with your eyes, verse 39 to 56. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. Now she just heard the angel told her that your, your cousin is now pregnant for five months and nobody knows about it because Elizabeth hit herself. And so she made haste, and I can see it here, she just would have not just saluted, as in, you know, a salute, there would have been a big hug and kisses, and except she saluted her. She would have wrapped her arms around her and said, how are you doing? Especially in her old age. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So Elizabeth herself was a saved woman. She possessed Christ. She possessed God, my Lord. For lo, as soon as the voice of the salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed. She's talking about Mary here. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit rejoiced in God, my Saviour. Mm. So in other words, Mary made known the Lord. That's what the word magnified means, is to make known, mm. to, to spread the news. She, she wasn't the sort of woman to hang back and not speak about God. There is something about Mary, something so special about Mary, that the Christ child was brought through her womb. Mm. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour. Once again, just like Elizabeth, she was a saved woman. God my Saviour. In the Old Testament, people were saved by faith in God. Just like we do today, they were saved by faith. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. She possessed God in her heart, and she was a humble person. This Mary was humble. She possessed God in her heart. We said that in verse 48. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. So she wasn't a proud person. Pride brings us unstuck, doesn't it? Yeah. Pride really does. It brings us unstuck. Well, that was the original sin with Satan. It was pride. Pride entered his heart. And today it's the same with mankind. Same with all of us. It can enter our hearts and ruin us. But Mary here was not a proud person. She understood who she was. She said that my lower state. She was a very humble person. And we see here in verse 49 that she acknowledged God's providence in her life. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. So she understood that God would provide her all things. The providence of God. Do you see it in your life? In the daily happenings, maybe each day or each week or a month or a year goes by and you can see God working in your life. Yeah. Mary understood this. There's something about Mary. She acknowledged God's providence in her life. In verse 50, it says here, And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. We looked at this a while back. There's two generations in the Bible. There's a generation of the wicked, and then there's a generation of the just. And the generation of the just, as it says, and I just forget the scripture, that it's insurmountable. Who can know it? Who can know the number of Christ's generation? The generation of the just. So she belonged to the generation of the righteous, understanding it was through his mercy that she was saved, and understanding that fearing his disapproval of sinful actions would sanctify her or set her apart from others who did not. She understood this, for his mercy is on them that fear him. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, do you fear God today? Yeah. Do you fear his righteous judgments in your life? Mm. We need to fear God. Because one day we're going to meet him. Yeah. We're going to meet him face to face mm. and give an answer for the judgment seat of Christ for the things done in the body, whether they were good 
whether they were bad. Mm. Our sins are all dealt with, but they will want to. They will, there's going to be coming a, a reckoning, so to speak, a, a debrief is what I call it. I know working in the bushfires years ago with the Forest Commission and Department of Sparks and Embers and all the rest of them, Department of Environment and it's Department of Constant Name Changes, um, there's always a debrief at the end of a fire. You sit down and you go through the things that worked, some of the things that didn't work, um, some close calls you may have had or the reasons why you lost a chainsaw or a couple of Rakos or, or whatever the case may be. But there's always a debrief. And indeed, that's what the, the judgment seat is going to be. Don't be afraid of the judgment seat. Unless you're not submitting yourself to Christ because you will suffer loss. You, you will be saved, saved by fire. But we should be looking forward to it. As Christians who have submitted ourselves, just like Mary, we should look forward to that day where disputes with other Christians will be settled there and then, done with, out of the way, no more to worry us. Our tears will be wiped away and we have a beautiful fresh start with Christ, who we will be with forever. Amen. Ever, forever and ever, we will be his servants. I'm looking forward to that day. In verse 51, and as Mary is speaking here, uh, this is called the Mary the uh, Magnificent. Verse 51, it says, And he has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. So she also understood that Christ came, had come through her, and not to be proud, not the rich, nor those with governmental authority or the famous. You see, she didn't come, Christ didn't come through those people. He came through a humble handmaid of the Lord. There is something about Mary, and there is something about Mary that we should be looking at in our lives. And for the men, I don't mean changing your identity, which is going on so much today. Okay, it's, it's that within us. It's that very being of our soul. It's actually our heart. If you turn back quickly, if keep your bookmark there, but Deuteronomy chapter 8, it's really our springboard text for the last few weeks. It's our springboard text. There's something about our hearts. As it says here in Deuteronomy chapter 8, in verse 2, it says here, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. Now that's our lives. We're in the wilderness. Okay? To humble thee and to what? To prove thee. To know what was in thine heart. Whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. I'm a firm believer that our characters are our hearts. And that's what we take with us when we die. We take our hearts. Yes, I understand. We don't take. We, we come to the world with nothing. We go with nothing. Well, I don't know if that's true because we take our hearts with us. Yeah. Even the even the rich man, he had empathy for his brethren that were that when he was in hell. He felt for his brethren, but he was still wanting to argue with with Abraham. Yeah. He was still wanting to argue his case. But you see here, it's what we take in our hearts. It's that's why we're still here. Christ is still sanctifying each and every one of us where he can get us to the point where he can use us for in service for him and then he'll say, I'm taking you home now. I've got you where I want you. Now I can use you. And sometimes he does that to us. Sometimes I think the little children die that the Lord's already taken. He has. He's taken care of them. Where there is no law, then there is no... Um, what's that verse again? Where the law is not, oh, I've lost that one. Where the law is not imputed, um, there is no judgment. So for little children who don't know the law, don't understand the law, but if they die, there's no judgment. They go straight to heaven to be with Christ. There's plenty of evidence in Scripture to show this. But Mary here, if we go back to Luke, if we go back to Luke, and we read verses 52 to 53, where it says, He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent away empty. Mary knew, and, and this is what she was saying, this is what she was prophesying, this is what she understood. God doesn't come through the rich. Christ wasn't going to come through the mighty. He came through a humble woman called Mary who possessed God. She was a saved woman. Devout, Save woman. She, she expressed 
how that spiritually desiring people would be filled. Whereas those who are rich and have all they desire now with all, what all the world can offer will not be filled and will remain hungry. And that the rich he has sent away empty. This is it, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven because they don't want to give up their riches. That's true. And their riches are their idols. Mm. And indeed we need to, as we read in one of those verses this morning, we've got to cleanse ourselves from idols and money is one of those idols. We can't be in, held in bondage to that particular idol. So from here we see that, that Mary was a saved woman. Her soul magnified the Lord. She was rejoicing because God was her saviour. And she understood that she will be called blessed from generation to generation. She understood that he did mighty things in her life. And indeed, this was a huge thing when Gabriel came and told her what was about to happen. And she understood his mercy and, and the fear of them from generation to generation. We do fear the Lord, but it's with a godly fear. We're not frightened of him. We fear that we might upset him and hurt his and say feelings, but we don't want to hurt his feelings. No. We want to do the best by Christ. We do. And we fear that. But now we've got a good understanding of Mary here and how humble she was. She wasn't a proud person. She understood the Bible. She understood the Word of God. And she immediately submitted herself in verse 38. Be it unto me according to thy word. She put the white flag and said, Yep, let it happen, Lord. I'm submitting to you now. But then as we just go through here, before we look at another Mary, um, we see to hear the prophecy of Zacharias. And I only want to go down to verse 40 for this one. Sorry, verse 70 of uh, chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verse 70. And this is Zacharias giving um, his prophecy when he was able to speak again because of his sin of unbelief at that time, okay, his mouth was open. But I want to point out here, in verse 70 it says, And as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, this is talking about God, okay, which have been since the world began. So since the world began, there has always been someone who is preaching the word of God. Always. Think of Noah. Go back before then. There has always been men or someone, men and women, speaking the word of God. <coughs> Teaching. That's what it says. And as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. There has always been a witness from God. He has never, ever left mankind without a witness. Ever. We'll just quickly read from 71 to 80. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath which he sware to our father Abraham. That he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of uh, the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Mm -hmm. Now that is submitting to Christ, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Serving him continually all the days of our lives. Mm. And thou, our child, this is talking about John the Baptist, shall be called the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. So he was preaching the baptism of repentance. So people repented, they were saved, and then they were baptized. Biblical baptism in water. Through thy tender, the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness, and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, and was in the deserts till the day of his showing in Israel. Mm. So we see here that John was to give light to them that sat in darkness, and in the shadow of death to guide our feet. Indeed, there are many people that we know, family, friends, who are still sitting in the shadow of death. You know, I call them the walking dead. Jesus himself said, let the dead bury the dead. They are the walking dead. As John 3 says, you are condemned already. You don't need enough to do anything to 
go to hell. Mm. You're condemned already. Mm. But if you believe through Jesus Christ, in, through, and on, and what he's done on the cross, you repent of your sins, then you belong to him. Yeah. Belong to him. And at that moment, you are saved and are a child of God. Mm. You have your place already in the heavenly, so to speak. We are priests now. I'm just waiting for that day when we go back and have that debrief. Man, I'm waiting for that day. It's going to be good. And to hear those words, I pray, well done, that good and faithful servant. But we need to submit like Mary. That's what we need to do. Not like Zacharias. I've been praying for those things for years and possibly quite a repetitive prayer. I know we all pray things I do in the morning. You tend to repeat your normal prayers. That's fine. It's normal. It's good. But then they'll get answered. And they go, okay, I've got to do something now. <laughs> a little bit of fear comes up, but then, no, no, it's okay. I've got it. I've got your back. That's what God says to us. I've got your back. And we see here that John's job was to prepare uh, a people for the Lord. And indeed, we see that back in Luke uh, verse 17. Uh, once again, it was about John. He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. This is John the Baptist to turn the hearts of the fathers of the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make a ready people prepared for the Lord. This was the Lord's church that he was going to start before mm -hmm. Pentecost. Mm -hmm. He had a people prepared under the baptism of repentance. They were saved. And, and I think it was Andrew and Peter followed John. And I believe that's when it first started. But two or three are gathered in my name. There am I in the midst. And this church belongs to Christ. Not man's denominations which are falling around around our ears. And they are falling. And there are a lot of people who are disappointed and are wondering what on earth is going on with COVID and everything else. But the Lord's churches, they're still going. If they're not, well, they should be. We should never ever forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But he had prepared a people for the Lord to work with. And he trained those preachers. He ordained them himself. Christ ordained them. And they, he sent them out preaching and healing. They had a healing ministry. They had a treasurer. They sung hymns. They preached. They gathered together. It was a church. And it was the Lord's church. Just like we are here today. But what about Mary? What about Mary? Verse 38, we see the submission. Verses 46 to 55, we see faith and piety. In Luke 2, 51, we'll just back there, Luke 2, 51, we see, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. There was a spiritual mindedness in Mary. She kept all those things in her heart. She also had maternal confidence. John 2, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 2. John chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. John 2, 3 to 5. She had a maternal confidence. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. This would have just been grape juice, the Muslim, before uh, they turned it into alcohol. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto his, the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, or saith unto you, do it. So she had confidence in Christ. She was submissive, she was humble, and she had confidence in Christ. And today, when we sometimes tend to fear with what's happening out there in the world, Mary here had confidence. And these would have been big times of upheaval too. They had the, the Roman rule, etc. Wicked men in government like King Herod. No difference in the day. We've got wicked people in government too. There are some good ones there, but I think they're far outweighed. But Mary still had confidence in Christ. What is Seth? Do it. And she had a maternal love. John 19. 25. John 19, 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, 
and Mary Magdalene. Mary had a maternal love for her son, Jesus Christ. A maternal love. She was there at the cross. Man, that must have been tough. To see him flogged, Christ flogged like he was, and he was flogged. <coughs> Beyond recognition, a bloodied body, in much pain, and then taken to the cross. Uh, yeah, I, I tend to well up when I think of that. You know, he did that for us. You just look at this this poster we got on the on the wall here. Where it's got Christ here kneeling, you know, stretched out arms, and all the sins of wicked men and women on top of his shoulders. That's what he took for us. That's what he took for us. And Mary witnessed it. Oh, I think that's incredible. An incredible woman is Mary. And then there is another Mary. This is point two. And this Mary possessed seven devils. We'll quickly move through these. But this Mary possessed seven devils. You see this in Mark chapter 16. Matthew Mark. Mark chapter 16. A little bit of finger exercising this morning. Mark chapter 16 and verse 9. I want to do a comparison between two other Marys. So we'll look at the second Mary now. So we've seen Mary, the mother of Jesus, and who she was. And why wouldn't God want God the Father to send his son, his only begotten son, through her? She was perfect in that sense. She was still a. Um, like us, a wicked woman, but she was submitted to Christ. And this is the point today. If we submit to Christ, he can use us. Yeah. He can use you. Mark 16, 9 says, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Mm. This Mary had seven devils within her. Jesus cast them out. I don't know if you, any of you saw this last year, but I saw it on TV, an interview with a woman. I don't know what her name was, I don't think it was Mary, but she said she had seven personalities. I thought that's interesting. Mary had seven spirits, seven evil spirits. And this woman said she had seven personalities. What's the chances? It's the same one. My brother saw the same thing and we discussed this. He said, yeah, I thought of that as soon as I saw it. Is it the same seven spirits? Mm. I don't know. But this poor woman, she was, had a miserable life yeah. fighting these seven spirits. Mm. Yet Christ here cast them out of Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, she had a wonderful conversion. Luke 8 2. Luke 8 2. Luke chapter 8 and verse 2. Also, verse 1. And he came to pass after that he went through every, out every village, this is Christ, and preaching, and village preaching, and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. So she had a marvelous saving experience, if I could use that word. A wonderful conversion. She showed her gratitude by ministering to Christ. Mark 15, Matthew, Mark. Just back a few. Not many pages we've got to turn today. Uh, it's all in the same area. Uh, Matthew uh, chapter 15. Matthew 15 and 40 to 41. Mary had a ministry of ministering to Christ. And what it says here, there were also women looking on afar off among whom was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and uh, the lesser of Joseph and Salome, who also, when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered unto him, and many other women which came up with him unto Jerusalem. So she served Christ, Mary Magdalene. She wasn't, a, she wasn't Mary, the mother of Jesus, but she was ministering and serving Christ. Think on that. She wasn't Mary, Mary of the Bible of, of, of the, who gave birth to Christ. She was the Mary who had seven spirits cast out. But she was submitting to Christ and Christ was using her and blessed her greatly, as we'll see shortly. You see, she was present at the cross in John 19, 25. In John 19, 25. 
We see here it says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. So out of this woman went seven devils, but she's stuck by Christ, even to his death. She's stuck by Christ. That was in John 19, 25. She was present there with Mary, the mother of Christ as well. See, this was a family affair. If you go and have a look at all the disciples, there were brothers in there. They were good friends. And then mum and dad would come along as well. You see, the, the mothers are here. See, this is a real family church, the one that Jesus started. They didn't fight about the flowers that someone put up on the stage and got it wrong or, or whatever. And I've heard of church splits over flowers. It's so sad, yes. There wasn't any of that. They were a family. They were at one. And the mothers were involved in this, in this ministry. I think it's wonderful to see. And a lot of these, these boys are really only older teenagers. John would have been the youngest because he, he died the last. He was probably only an old teenager, 19, 20, I don't know. But he wasn't an old man then. He was a young man. Young men serving Christ. And their mothers and fathers were involved as well. Definitely the mothers. Definitely the women. So she had a wonderful conversion. She showed, showed uh, her, her, her gratitude to Christ by ministering to him. She was present at the cross. And then she's also present at the sepulchre. Matthew 27. Matthew 27. I hope you find this as exciting as I do. Matthew 27. Verse 61. Matthew 27, 61. And it says here, And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulchre. She was there. She understood what she was saved from was so mighty and so powerful that she had no other choice but to follow Jesus to his death and then to his grave, the sepulchre. She followed him. And when you probably would have seen Mary the first time before her wonderful conversion, she was possessed with seven devils. What was she like? Well, we're going to look out about in the outside world to see what people are who are drug users, alcoholics, etc., etc., to see what demonic control that people are under today. And indeed, we've got a book at the back there, um, The Liquid Devil, and the Bible calls it um, what do we call it again in, in Corinthians? The cup of devils. Alcohol is called the cup of devils. Well, and if, yeah. Strong drink is called spirits because they are spirits. Yeah, totally. And they mix them. That's right. Spirits are not good. They send you a trop real quick. But you'll see there in context that you're not supposed to even partake of all the supper in a church setting if you're habitually drinking alcohol. It forbids it. You cannot partake of the Lord's Supper and the cup of devils. Very interesting. She was present at the cross and at the sepulchre. And indeed, in 28, one, she was there. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. You know, she was the first person to whom Christ appeared after his resurrection in Mark 16, 9. She was given a wonderful revelation in John chapter 20. This is this other Mary, John chapter 20. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 20, um, verses 11 to 18. John 20, 11 to 18, where it says, But Mary stood without at the sepulchre, weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre. This is Mary Magdalene. And see two angels in white sitting the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord. See, my Lord. She, she possessed Christ. My Lord. Not your God. My Lord. That's what she said. My Lord. And I know not where they had lain him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou of him, seekest thou? She supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Serve if thou were 
have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, uh, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto the Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mm. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that, and that he had spoken these things unto her. See, when Mary first saw the Lord here, Mary Magdalene, Christ had not yet ascended to the Heavenly Father to sprinkle the blood on the, on the altar in, the, in, the, um, in, in heaven, on the altar, in the temple there, the tabernacle, sorry. So you had to go and sprinkle that blood on the tabernacle, which is still there today, fresh. The Bible says this, it states this. It's fresh today. This blood will not dry up. And when you look at the wording in your King James Bible and it says nail prints, it doesn't say scars. Other versions may say scars, but this Bible says nail prints. Those nail prints are still fresh today in Christ's hand. The blood will never, ever dry up on that altar that has been sprinkled in heaven. That's why Mary couldn't touch him. She, still, she was still tainted with corruptible blood, just like you and I are. But later on, you see, and I think it's in Mark, where they, both women were allowed to touch him. So he ascended up to heaven, sprinkled the blood on the, on the altar, came back down, and then the rest is history, as they say. And then they were allowed to hold him and touch him, and they did. Mm. They did. But here he wasn't, they weren't allowed to touch him. And we see that in Matthew 28, verse 9. Just, just to prove a point, Matthew 28, verse 9. Okay, I don't want to keep it too long. And it says here, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them. So he met them again, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. So this is the course of events. Mary Magdalene, the one whom the seven devils had been thrown out, saw, was, had the privilege of seeing Christ risen first, such as the forgiveness of God. Jesus goes up, ascends, sprinkles the blood on the altar, comes back down, and then he's met by these two women. And this time, they're allowed to touch him. I think that's marvellous. I think that's marvellous. What a remarkable honour to be bestowed upon someone who had seven devils cast out. What a remarkable honour. Christ himself. The third Mary, which is the last Mary today, is Mary of Bethany. And point three of this is, this Mary possessed good works. And this is where I want to challenge us today. This Mary was immortalised by Christ. Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. Verses 3 to 9. Mark chapter 14. Verses 3 to 9. And it says, I shall start at verse 1. After uh, two days was the feast of the Passover of an unleavened bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. Some would call this a conspiracy. <laughs> Aren't we told that, you know, tin hat wearers or four hat wearers are conspiracy theorists? Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of those conspiracies are coming true. <laughs> what I've seen. Turn up the website on the Australian um, government website and you'll see we're talking about chips, implantable chips into people yeah. and the ramifications of it. It's there. It's not, it's not in the shadows anymore. In verse 2, but they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, my goodness, Christ came to a leper. Didn't, it didn't phase Christ one bit, did he? Who he sat with. Someone who was diseased. He sat with the lepers. And as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment and spikenard, very precious. And she broke the box and put it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. They murmured against a good woman doing what she thought was right for Christ. Mm. 
what Christ had laid it on her heart to do. And Jesus said, let her alone. You know, I can see Christ, he's not, he's not mincing words here. No. Let her alone. You know, he's telling him, leave her be. Don't mess with Mary. <laughs> he's telling her, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye are the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may be good to them. And indeed we do. Indeed we do. With tithes and offerings and what we put in there, we do good to those. To spread the gospel. To help the poor, the children who are starving in this world. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel, in other words, the word gospel means good news. So whether this gospel or good news shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she had done shall be spoken of her, sorry, of for a memorial of her. This Mary has been immortalized in scripture. We read about Mary of Bethany. There is something about this Mary. You know, Christ here, he didn't worry him about sitting with those who are diseased. But these other fault-finding peanuts just wouldn't let her alone. But Christ put them in their place. Let her alone. Leave her be. Luke chapter 10. If we go up here, we'll talk about this Mary just a little bit more. It won't keep you too much longer. But Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. Luke 10... 38 to 42. And this is the same Mary, Mary of Bethany. Now it came to pass, and I think you'll recognise this story. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. This Mary was in into God's word. She would sit at the feet of Christ and just listen. And that's what we need to do. Yeah. Sit at the feet of Christ and just listen. Yeah. Read, let it soak into your hearts and listen to what the word has got to say. But Martha was coming about with much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she should help me, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Shall not be taken away from her. Mm. She possessed Christ too. And she was not going to lose him. That good part, she understood. She wanted to listen to what God had got to say. And it was not going to be taken from her. But how many Marthas do we know in this world? Sometimes I think I do change gender and I become a Martha. I worry about everything. <laughs> you do. We, we turn to worry about things. We're here, we're there. We can do three towns in one day or we can do whatever. You know, we can be so busy that we're not sitting at the feet of Jesus. There is something about this Mary. There is something about it. This Mary had spiritual receptivity. In verse 39, she was receptive to God's words. She sat at Jesus' feet. This Mary had spiritual insight. In verse 42, there's one thing that is needful. And Mary knew what was needful in her life. She had spiritual insight. And this is what we can take away today from this Mary. She was also a person who was quiet and with resignation. And we see this in John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Chapter 11, if you don't mind turning there, not long to go. John chapter 11 and verse 20. And Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. This is when they lost their brother, Lazarus, when he died. Yeah. Remember that story, that account, I should say. Yeah. She was quiet. She didn't go out like Martha. Mm. Martha might have been a bit more extrovert, maybe. I don't know, but Martha was a bit more, so Mary was a bit more introverted, a bit more soft and tender hearted. And she resigned herself to the fact that my brother has died and Christ will come to him. And that's exactly what happened. Exactly what happened. 
You know, she sat three times at Christ's feet. We see this in Luke 10, 39. Luke 10, oh, that's John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke 10, I think it's myself, verse 39. We just read that. So she sat at Jesus' feet three times. Do you read your Bible for instruction? Do you do that, what Mary did? Do we do that? We need to do that. This Mary sat three times at Christ's feet. And we see it was for instruction here in verse 39 of Luke 10. Then she sat at Christ's feet for comfort in John 11, 32. Let's just turn there. John 11, 32. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. So she sat at his feet for instruction, then she sat at his feet for comfort. This is something important about this Mary. And there's something else that Mary did in John chapter 12, just over a page in verse 3. Then took Mary a pound of ointment and spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odour of the ointment. She sat at his feet for service. You know, that's something that we should be doing. We should always be sitting at the feet of Jesus for instruction, for comfort, and for service. That's what we should be doing. You know, she wiped the dust or she wiped the, probably the dust and the grime of Christ's feet. But I fear there are many Bibles today that we don't wipe clean because it's got dust on it and it's not being used. Mm. We need to do that. Yeah. If your Bible's got dust on it at home, you need to wipe it clean. Be like Mary, Mary of Bethany. She sat at the feet of Christ for instruction, comfort and service. And that's something we need to do. Even in these trying times, these tough times that we're going through, and they are, but we have the full assurance of God's words that his prophecies will come true. This was written outside of time. How else can you have God a hundred years before this guy was born, called him a king and called his name Cyrus and told the world what King Cyrus was going to do a hundred years before he was born? Man can't guess that. Man can't write that. This was written outside of time by someone who sees the beginning the to the end. And we look at this time here and Jesus, I wish you'd come and fix it now. What are you saying when I'm looking at it? And it's, it's already fixed. <laughs> He's in eternity. It just blows my mind when I try and think of that. We think, why isn't God doing something now? Well, he has. It's actually been solved, but it's been solved in the future. It's already been solved in eternity. Your soul's already been saved in eternity if you are willing enough in this time to accept him as your Christ, as your Lord and Saviour. If you've done that and you belong to Christ, you cannot lose your salvation. And all those spurious verses where people say, well, look at that, you can lose it. No. Look at carefully at what the verse is saying. It's talking about sanctification. Sanctifying your life until it gets you to a point of being useful for it. Justification happens once. And clearly reversed to say that we are justified when we come to Christ with a repentant heart and accept him as our Lord and Saviour. You are justified. And then you are sanctified through life as he leads you through life, building on your life, your character, which is in Deuteronomy 8.2, your heart. And that's what he wants to prove. Your heart, so that he can use you and give you a good judgment seat of Christ, somewhere where you won't be afraid to front up when you give your debrief. Lord, I've done my best. And you'll say, that's fine. I've covered your sins. They're already covered. They're never brought up again. And to that, I'll give the joy of thy Lord. I'm glad, I'm hoping, I'm praying that that sermon today on the three Marys, we can see ourselves in this. We see the Mary, the mother of Christ, and how great a woman she was. We see Mary Magdalene, of what sort of a woman she was, but yet she was privileged to see Christ. 
as soon as he had risen. What a privilege. And yet she was a sinner, like all of us. Even the mother of Christ was still a sinner. And then we see Mary of Bethany, someone who possessed those things that only a saved soul possesses, sitting at, at the foot of Christ, receiving instruction, comfort, and also service. Mm. Let's think of these things this week as we go out in this world, how we can be a blessing to others. And we need to be a blessing to others. We are the hands and feet and mouthpieces of Christ. Mm. This is how he spreads his word through us. Yeah. Let's do it this week. Let's be here for Christ. Let's be a Mary of Bethany. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your words. Father, indeed, that at the birth of Christ, Father, there is so much to be gleaned from all the people and the characters of the Lord who were involved at that time. And Father, you had everything under perfect control. Jesus Christ himself was kept safe from those that would harm him. And Father, we can see in this day today, in, in our lives, the Lord, you can also keep us safe from those who would harm us, Father. Mm -hmm. And all we need to do is submit unto you and come what may. Father, once again, we just thank you for your words. We thank you for the, the precious blood that was shed on Calvary, Lord, for us, for sinners. Even if they drop that blood into hell now, all the fires of hell will be put out forever. That's how powerful your divine blood is. Father, we just thank you for this. We thank you for your words. Lord, take us away this week safely, mentally, physically, and spiritually, Lord, as we do battle out in the world. And help us, Lord, just to rely upon you and your words which you promised to leave us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.